what is artificial intelligence? When you do research in AI, as I do, then you get to watch movies that have AI in them and think of it as part of the curriculum. It's very cool. So let's look at a few examples. This is HAL 9000 from the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. This is the inimitable Arnold in the character of Terminator of the same name. These are the Agent Smiths in The Matrix. And most recently, this is David in Prometheus. Agents that are able to move around and act on their own. So why was it portrayed this way? Well, the reason is that throughout the centuries, creating intelligence machines is something that humankind has sought after. A very early example is the Talos. This originates from Greek mythology. They built a bronze statue that would walk around the island of Crete three times a day to defend it from invaders. Of course, this is a myth, but this is one of the first known examples where man wanted to make a machine that would act on its own, that would have intelligence. Later on, you have the Colossus. This is the first supercomputer. This was built by the Allies and helped win the World War since it was used to decipher encrypted messages from the Germans. More recently, you have AI embedded in toys. This is known as the Tamagotchi, and there was a huge hit in the 90s. It's basically a small toy that you have to care for, you have to feed it, you have to train it. Otherwise, it would die or become fat or just be plain unhappy. And more recently, you have natural language processing applications, such as Siri, which is now also found in, found in other phones. This is not an Apple sales pitch. Um, where you can speak to it in a natural way and it will understand what you do. So it's safe to say then that AI is the ability to learn, predict and adapt to its environment. So, but why don't we have the Terminators or the Agent Smiths that you saw on the previous slide? Well, an important aspect is that in the 50s, when the term AI was coined, they predicted machines would be more powerful than the human mind within the next 10 years or so. However, the way they built AI was built on logic and rules. And this worked well in a laboratory setting where your experiment was to move blocks on top of another block. But this failed spectacularly when released into the wild, when you tried to make a robot that would work in the real world. So a new school of AI emerged with a focus on using biological models such as neural networks as these building blocks. These models are then better, to, better suited to deal with these real world problems. That is a world that's hard to predict, it's noisy and it might even change itself. Using a model like neural network is like you learn. You learn by example. So for instance, when you try to learn how to play the piano, you'll most likely be quite bad at it when you start out. But as you practice, more and more you will get better. So when I started studying artificial intelligence, I thought it would be very interesting to, to examine the more fun, that is the more artistic and creative parts of human behavior. And I quickly became interested in learning by imitation. So the first project in my PhD, I did a simulated robot that would imitate human dance movements using learning by imitation. So I was the demonstrator and the robot would then imitate me. And the dance was the YMCA by the village people, which I'm sure you all know. It consists of forming the letters Y, M, C, and A with your arms. So the robot then tried to do the same. And remember, this is done then during, using neural networks. So in the beginning, the arms of the robot goes like this, and it doesn't really know how to move and it looks like, kind of like a child. But it gets better over time. So in the video I will show you, you will not, be, you will not see the motor babbling, as it's called, but it doesn't perform anything nice to look at. You will see its ability to imitate. This is then after training, after it's trained for some time.
When I was doing this research, I thought to myself, is this for real? Can I be dancing the YMCA by the village people and call it research? Surely it can't get any better than this. I was wrong. Being a drummer, I then had the idea of making an artificial drummer that would sound and move the same as that of human drummers. This would also be a natural continuation of my work on imitating human dance movements. So I made a system. Software for hierarchical extraction and imitation of drum patterns in a learning agent, Sheila for short. Directly named after Sheila E., the drummer for Prince in the 80s. Now, why would I want to do this? Apart from it being very cool, a drum machine plays perfectly, and to human ears, this sounds quite different from that of human playing. I investigated the drum machine software at the time, and they had no intelligent way of making drum patterns human. Most plugins, as they're called, had a way to humanize, which basically consisted of added, adding noise to the drum patterns. But in my mind, the noise, the errors, is not what makes human drummers sound groovy. They are simply human. They are not making mistakes. So to train the system, I had five different drummers. They all had to play this pattern. And for the drummers in the audience, you know this pattern. It's one of the first drum figures you will learn. But for the rest of you, I'll, I'll play a sound sample. So this is what it sounds like played by a drum machine. This sounds very rigid and machine-like and far from how a human would play it. A human will vary both the tempo and the dynamics. The tempo is then how much the drummer relates to the metronome, if it's a bit before or after, and the dynamics is how hard the drummer will hit the drums. These variations can then be learned by neural networks. And the neural networks then have a model so they can generate new drum patterns that are similar, but they will not be identical. And this is a very important distinction. It's not a mere recording and a playback, but the neural networks can then be used to generate new drum patterns. So how does this work? This shows two different drummers playing the same pattern as in the previous slide. You can see that drummer A is different from drummer B. The blue bar is the original training data, and the red bar is the output of Sheila. This is the imitation that Sheila makes. And you can see that the red bars and the blue bars are the same within each drummer. And also, you can see that the drummers are different. But Sheila is then able to imitate the playing style of each of these drummers. Furthermore, when it comes to tempo, Sheila then also is able to learn these minuscule changes that, that sound not, you, you can't hear them that easily, but which contribute a great deal to the feeling of groove. So this here is drummer A. This is how he is playing in relation to the metronome throughout an entire song. And you can see there are small changes all the time. The blue lines is the actual recorded data, and the green lines is when Sheila imitates. So we can see here, still, it's not exactly the same, but the tempo varies, and it varies to somewhat to the certain extent over time. But enough of talking, let's see a video how this system actually works. This shows the system setup. You have a MIDI drum kit, which makes it a lot easier to, to get drumming data. And you use 3D tracking equipment, which is indicated by these fluorescent markers that's on the body of the drummer. And they are spanned out with infrared cameras that's able to track the movements in 3D. This is then what Sheila hears and sees. And the drummer plays along to a rather cheesy tune that I wrote just so they would have something to play along to. 
So let's listen a bit more to the, what the human drummer sounds like before we will get the example of what it sounds like when Sheila imitates the same playing style. As you can see here, the blue character is the motion capture. This is what's directly being uh, read off the body of the drummer. This is what Sheila she sees. And Sheila then tries to imitate these movements, as you can see in the red character. The research I did had a focus on the artificial intelligence. So I just built the robot brain, so to say. And even the visualization here is very primitive. But what's the key message is that these neural networks, the brain then, has the same properties. So if you had, for instance, in the future, if we hopefully could get a robot with the same dexterity as that of a human drummer, you could take this robot brain and put it into a real physical robot. Because that's what it's doing. It's sending control signals and controlling a simulated robot. So basically, I'm saying building a physical robot was just way too hard in order to complete within the PhD. But the principles are there to be used on a physical robot. So let's see a bit more of how this actually works. So everything here is done use, using neural networks. The spirit then lives in the machine, so to say. But of course, this is still far away from the dexterity and flexibility of human drummers. Sheila can't play anything she isn't taught beforehand, for instance. And also, it's a quite a complex, expensive setup. You have to have a MIDI drum kit, you have to have 3D tracking uh, equipment. A natural extension would be, of course, to teach Sheila using sound files. Imagine you can take your Led Zeppelin collection and make Sheila play like John Bonham, or Ringo Starr of the Beatles, or Lars Ulrich of Metallica. But that's, it's hard to do. It's in my future work section, so to say. It could also be applied to games. In games like Guitar Hero and Rock Band, you control an avatar on screen, and you play either a guitar or you play the drums. However, the visualization of your character doesn't move in accordance to what you do, actually. So by using this system, you could then have an avatar on screen that would move, and it would look like you were playing, and it would give in a lot, more, a lot better visual representation of the game. However, the system is actually it's general in nature. Drumming was only the field of application because I am a drummer, and I thought it would be very cool to do research in this field. But in principle, it could be used anywhere to learn a human quality as opposed to a robotic quality if you have a robot, where you could train it using learning by imitation. For instance, if you had a robot butler, that would be very nice, very convenient to show it what you wanted it to do. Say you wanted to paint flowers all over your house, but you didn't have the time. You could then have a robot painter, and you could paint, you could show the robot, this is how I like to paint flowers. And then the robot would know how you do it, and it would be able to imitate your painting of the flowers. Come home the next day, house covered with flowers. And also, this final example, this is of a nurse robot. This is being developed in Japan. And you can imagine, if you have to deal with machines on such a close level, their ability to imitate and be human would then be, of a, would be preferable. So what's the main point to take home here? For me, it's embodied in this circle. This is not a perfect circle. This is drawn by a human. But what makes us human are these imperfections, the lack of being perfect, which to me is not the same as making errors, since being perfect is then something a machine could only ever achieve. Furthermore, the interaction with machines would without a doubt feel more natural and easy 
if they were able to learn such human qualities. Thank you. <laughs>